If uh, you're new here this morning, I want to introduce myself. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here, and it's my honor and privilege uh, to, to lead in that manner. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, kind of introduce the series to you. We are, uh, have been and currently are in this ser- a series called Jesus Stories, and we're looking at the 37 different miracles uh, found in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this morning we find ourselves in John chapter 2, John chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles out, if you do me a favor, go ahead and turn there this morning. How many of you have the physical word of God with you today? Yeah, come on, hold it up if you got it. You got to trust, uh, you got to read for what I'm saying. You know, you can't just trust me, uh, can you? You got to, you can trust me, don't put it that way, but you need to be able to read the word of God and have it in front of you too. Let's, uh, let's read this together, John uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through um, 11. It says this, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Verse 6. Now there were uh, set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Uh, If you like my notes this morning, you text notes to the number that is on the screen and what's in front of me will be in front of you. I've entitled this message this morning just simply... Water to wine, water to wine. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask for you, Father, to speak. Lord, without you, my words are just words and they're empty. Father, I pray that God, you would take your logos word, your written word, and God, you would make it rhema to us today. Lord, open our eyes to see clearly, God, what you want to show us. Father, we just ask this morning, God, that, Lord, you would teach us your ways. We want to know you. We want to find favor in you, Jesus. That, Lord, we say to you this morning, for speak to your servants, for we are listening, God. Lord, we want all that you have for us and nothing less. And so, Father, we come fully and completely submitted and yielded to you. Lord, I submit and yield to you, for, Lord, I'm nothing without you. So, Holy Spirit, pour out your presence in this place and to make your word alive. We love you, we bless you, we thank you, and everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Signs, signs. We look for signs in life, don't we? We look for signs when we're driving our car, a stop sign, a sign that says to yield, maybe railroad crossing, or a sign in life to know which direction to go, maybe God opening a door. I'm thankful when God opened doors I need to walk through, but I'm also thankful, equally thankful for closed doors. Sometimes God closes doors in our life. Signs, a, a miracle, as John refers to as a sign. You know, churches it have, um, have, uh, have put up some pretty funny signs in, uh, that, that I found on, online. I want to kind of show these to you this morning. I came across one this past week, which kind of sparked this. This is a miracle right here in of itself. No one ever talks about Jesus' miracle of having 12 close friends in his 30s. Go to the next one. A couple signs here. What's missing from church? <laughs> you are. Go to the next one. These gas prices are why the armies of Revelation are riding on horses. <laughs> having trouble sleeping? Try one of our sermons. <laughs> you might, some of you guys might feel that way about me. I don't, I don't know. 
Hopefully not. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for the encouragement this morning. <laughs> Noah was a brave man to sail in a wood boat with, only, with two termites. I mean, come on, Jesus. I like this one, creation. <laughs> cremation is your last chance for a smoking hot body. And this is what really sparked this whole thing because I had to share it in light of July, uh, our picnic and baptism this afternoon. You want to make sure you make it out at 2 o'clock. If you're a fan of Stranger Things, you should try a church potluck. <laughs> Signs. Signs. I love those. John 20. It says this. <laughs> How many of you are going to make something good at the church potluck this afternoon? It's not going to be strange. It's going to be on the money, right? (laughs) Verse 30 says this, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in him. Every miracle John recorded brings revelation about who Jesus was and his life. That's my prayer for us today is that we would find abundant life that is only found in Jesus. John 2.11 says this, which we read earlier, this beginning of signs Jesus did, this is talking about turning water to wine. So there are several words that John could have used to describe these miracles, but John chose to the, the, the eight miracles that he penned in the, in the Gospel of John, he chose to use to describe every miracle as signs. I want to give you a dip, biblical definition of signs this morning. It is this, a sign is a miracle that teaches a lesson and instructs us in which direction to go. They're miracles that show Christ's person in all of his glory. They're written not just to amaze, but also to instruct Now this miracle that happens, Jesus coming on the scene, is Jesus' first miracle. It symbolizes transformation. It symbolizes change. Now this is the first miracle that happens in over 400 years. From Malachi to John in Scripture, we don't see any miracle that take place. The last recorded miracle that we find in Scripture is 450 years earlier when God shut the mouths of lions in Daniel and the lion's den. So there's this time in this place of over 400 years of no miracles, of no signs. And Jesus comes on the scene at the age of 30, and he does these signs. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give you three lessons this morning, three lessons we can gather from this sign, this very first miracle. Because remember, signs are a miracle that teaches a lesson. Signs are a miracle that teaches a lesson. The first lesson I want to give us this morning is this. Sometimes we have to do the ridiculous in order for God to do the miraculous. How many of you know that? Sometimes we have to do the ridiculous in order for God to do the miraculous. Before we kind of dive into this statement, I want to give you some context for for this. Let's go to verse 3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman. Now, when it says they have no wine, when you go back and look at the original language here, you kind of discover that when it says they have no wine, it actually really means that the wine is almost about to run out. It wasn't that the wine was all the way run out, but it's about to run out. So, um, so the wine's about to run out. It's not all the, but all the way run out. And also when it says, when Jesus says, woman, it's not this derogatory term towards his mom. Jesus wasn't trying to shame her in any type of way. How many of you know Jesus wouldn't do that to his mom, right? <laughs> Obey your parents to the Lord for this is right. We're not going to do that. Jesus was simply just a mild rebuff when he says this. It wasn't derogatory. So he says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. What does this mean, my hour has not yet come? Well, maybe Jesus' timing had to do with when the wine had completely run out, so he's waiting to do the miracle until that point. Or maybe it was just that he was going to hear from the Father the next few moments. What we said about the series that Jesus didn't do anything outside of the will of the Father, right? He only did what the Father asked him to do, so maybe he was still waiting to hear from the Father. 
But Mary had, desert, had observed no miracle f- from Christ until this point. But obviously she knew Jesus from the time that he was born. But she knew obviously something was different about Jesus because of the, how he was conceived through the Holy Spirit. And so she says these powerful words in verse 5. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Yeah? She says to the servants, whatever he says to you, just do it. Not whatever he says to you, pray about it. Not whatever he says to you, go and ask your friend about it, whether or not I should do it and have a forum. No, he says what she, he, she says to them, whatever he says to you, just do it. Now look at this, verse 6. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So in this passage which we read, we see two over-the-top, ridiculous commands that Jesus gives to the servants. The first command he asks them is this, fill the water pots. The second command is take the water to the master. So let's talk about this first command, fill the water pots with water, and then we'll talk about the second one. When he says, fill the water pots with water, this does not make sense at all. What do you think about it? How many of you know that Jesus could have just, because he's the son of God, and he had the power of the Holy Spirit, he can do anything he wants to do, he could have just simply just filled them with wine, without the water. But Jesus asked him, hey, fill the water pots with water. Now, when you think about this as well, it's not like they can go to a hose and put in the water pots and turn the faucet on, and then boom, they filled up, is it? They didn't have that back then. So what was the process of them filling up? They had to probably grab something around a two-gallon bucket, Go out to the well, put the bucket down into the well, draw the water out, and do this over and over and over and over again. So if they had a two-gallon bucket, just think about this. That was 75 trips, because 150 gallons total, 75 trips they would have had to take to put water in these vessels. This was over the top. This was laborious. It wasn't an easy task. Jesus gave the command, and it took some work to do it. It wasn't easy. They had to do something on their part as well. But they didn't complain. The scripture doesn't say they complained at all. They didn't complain one bit. What did they do? They just did it. The second command that Jesus asked of them, he said to them, draw some out in verse 8. Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. I bet these guys were thinking to themselves in that moment, like, like Jesus, you won't now, okay, we filled these water pots up and now you want us to take it to the master of the feast, like, like Lord, like if it's water and it's not wine, I'm surely gonna lose my job here. And this job is supporting my whole entire family. And they're kind of, I bet in their mind, they're kind of going through all this, but what do they do? They just do it. They just do it. They simply hear the command that Jesus gives. And there's no past history of of Jesus doing any miracles at all. But yet they believe and yet they still do what he asked them to do. So they bring the water to the master. Sometimes you have to do the ridiculous in order to see the miraculous. You see this act in which they did, it took what? It took faith. You see, we must obey even if at times it doesn't make any sense. And you may not feel at times that God, you may feel at times that God is almost toying with you. He's having a laugh at your expense because he's asking you to do something over the top, ridiculous. But let me assure you, he's not. Our part is to obey and to do it zealously, to fill it up to the brim. And once we've obeyed, the miracle part is up to who? It's up to Jesus. It's up to him. We draw the water, he turns it to wine. We lower the nets, he brings the fish. We circle the city and shout, and he brings the walls down. Amen? Sometimes we have to do the miraculous or the ridiculous in order to see the miraculous. Sometimes God in our life will ask us to do things that just don't make sense to us. And when we know, when we feel it, it's, it's, when we hear the God, God's voice, it's not like this, this, uh, this, this, this voice that we hear with our ears. I've never really heard the Lord like that before. 
Could it happen? Anything's outside the realm of God. But what I feel in my heart is just this quickening in my heart. Man, God is speaking to me right now, and I have to do this thing. I have to act. I have to be obedient. It's this knowing in my heart because I have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, just as you have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And it's this knowing in your heart of hearing his voice, and in hearing his voice, just be obedient, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when you're like, Lord, I might look like a fool right now. What do you do? You fill the water pots. You take the water to the master even when it doesn't make sense. And what does he do? He turns it to wine. I mean, when did, when did the water actually turn to wine? There's no real indication of when the water turned to wine. There's no indication at all. My, my personal belief is that as they dipped it and they put it in the cup and they served it to the master, that's when the miracle took place and the water became wine. Let me give you now point number two. The next lesson we can learn from the sign of Jesus turning water to wine is this. Whatever you do, do it with zeal. Whatever you do, do it with zeal. Do it with zeal. I was uh, on vacation, like I said, uh, last week, and um, we were at a lake house with two other families, uh, my sister and brother-in-law and one of our best friends, and we've been doing this vacation now for the past five years. It's made us an incredible week of just getting away and relaxing, eating food and sleeping a lot and getting out on, on the lake, on the boat and going tubing. And, but one thing that we do every single year when we go on vacation um, for this particular vacation is we play basketball against uh, some of the younger boys. So uh, me, and, me and my two friends, um, they're, they're 45, uh, 46, and they have uh, older kids. They're a more teenage, uh, teenage age. They're 15, 16, 17. And so every single year for the past five years, we've been playing them in basketball, this game. And, of course, with them being younger, this game was super easy. Like, you know, we, first year we, we played five years ago, no problem at all. We put them away. We were a little bit younger, right? And now they're 15, 16, 17, and we're playing this game. And, like, we're coming to the realization, man, we're getting a little bit old and they're getting a lot older, and like we're going up for a re- I'm going for a rebound, and like you know my vertical these days is more like six inches, you know, like like this, like I can't get too far off the ground. And these boys, I mean, they're jumping and they're like they're almost dunking. I'm like, what is going on right now? And they're rebounding the ball over me, and I, I you know, I, I've said this before, I, was, I don't like to lose that much, especially to a 16, 17 year old. No offense to 16, 17 year olds, it's, I, I don't want to do that, especially in the game that I, we've won. And well, my buddies, they're like, you know, Adam, just just, just stop worrying about whether you win or lose. I'm like, guys, we have to give, give your best right now. Like, we can't, we can't lose this game because if we lose this game, it means that we're really old. I mean, I'm going to be 40 next year. And, and I don't want to deal with the consequence. They're 45, 46, and they're thinking, Adam, we're already old. We can't, we can't jump. You're right. We're, we're not fast. And they've already kind of given up the game before we even started because they understand their boys are now better than we are. And, well, I'm still fighting. I still believe we're going to win the game. Well, what happens for the first time in five years? We... We lose the game. But I kind of relay it back to them. I was like, hey, guys, like, have some passion here. Like, let's, let's try. We beat, we beat them the first game, actually, because, well, uh, we had some energy. About the first game, man, I'm, I'm spent. Like, I don't have any more energy left. I'm done. And, and they pretty much dominated us from that point forward. But uh, it was hard to take in. But I'm, I say all this because they kind of went into the, to the, to the basketball game that we always win with a mindset of, we're going to lose, and so I'm not even going to try. And so this may be a bad example, and you might be saying, Adam, that's just a game. And yeah, you're, you're probably right. It's not the best example, and it is just a game. It's not just a game to me, but it, 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 I do know it's just a game. I really do. I don't, yeah, yeah. But in the kingdom of God, what are we supposed to do? Do it with zeal. Do it with everything you have. When we're serving God, like this is the kingdom of God and lives are at stake. We don't just go after it half-heartedly. This is, this is what it says um, here. Uh, John 2, 7, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. But how do they do it? What does it say? And they filled them up to the brim. They filled them up to the brim. They didn't fill them just halfway they didn't fill them just up to the point where there's like one inch left or in half an inch. No, they filled them all the way up to the brim. I think sometimes in our Christian walk with the Lord, like we can go through seasons, and I know I've gone through seasons. I'm 
certainly guilty of this, where I've just kind of gone at my walk with the Lord half-heartedly. And I've approached the Lord just, okay, God, I'm here. Instead of giving God everything, I have. And maybe you're like me and you're just saying, man, I'm in this stage right now where things have been hard and things have been difficult. And right now I'm not really giving Jesus all of who I am. And I'm inviting you this morning as I'm inviting myself, man, let's give Jesus everything that we have, everything that we are. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians it says, whatever you do, do it all for what? For the glory of God. Everything, do it all for the glory of God. If you pray, Men, pray without ceasing. Pray hard. Like, go after the Lord in your prayer time. If you're, we're called to evangelize, yep. And so, when evangelizing, man, give it all to Jesus. And and don't worry about what you look like. Share the gospel. If it's it's giving, give open-handedly. Fill it to the brim. Do it wholeheartedly. Don't hold anything back. If it's studying, turn the scriptures inside out and lay hold of them like your life depended on it. Study it precept upon precept. If it's believing, man, let's believe with all of our heart, not just half-hearted. I love the fact here that they didn't just fill them up, fill these water vessels up with just a little bit of water. What do they do? They filled it up to the brim. They went all the way. Point number three this morning, let me give you the next lesson we can learn from this this sign, this miracle, is this. Only those who experience Jesus understand it. Only those who experience Jesus truly understand it. You know, in high school, I really dealt with this a whole lot. Uh, I've told this story before, my testimony of I was encountered with the Lord when I was just 15 years old, 16 years old, and my life forever was changed. And a lot of my friends, when that really happened and my life was forever changed, they didn't quite really understand why I did what I did. Uh, I remember them inviting me on weekends all the time, hey, why don't you come party with us? Why don't you come uh, drink with us? Even when we're 16, 17, like, we had that opportunity, and I'd say, no, guys, you guys... I'm not doing any of this stuff. And they really didn't quite understand. I remember one time in particular where they showed up at my door when um, they knew my parents were out of town and they wanted to come and party. I said, just go, guys, go home. I'm not into that. But even as I kind of walked through that stage and I came to a place where I was called into ministry and I knew uh, that I was going to go into full-time ministry, I remember someone very close to me saying, Adam, you're not going to be able to provide for your family one day if you do that. Don't do that. You see, when we're following the Lord, sometimes he'll ask us to do things that other people, they may not understand. And really, as Christians, the world shouldn't understand us all the way. Because we're set apart, we're different. The master of the feast, he didn't know about this miracle. He just knew that there was wine. But the servants knew. It says this, when the master of the feast had tasted the water, that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. You see, the master of the feast didn't know of the change. Only the servants knew. Only those who experience life in Jesus really understand it, don't they? It's something you can't understand from the outside. You can only understand it from getting it on the inside. And you don't know, if you haven't noticed, but if you haven't noticed here, uh, the contents changed but not the pots themselves. The contents of the pots change, but not the pots themselves. Second Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. My friend, when you get saved, the part of you that changes is your spirit. The part of us that changes is a spirit of God that now comes, lives within us. It's not outward but what is it? It's inward. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. Now, obviously, that change is outward. You know, when I got saved, I still had red hair. When I got saved, when I went outside and to the sun in the middle of July, I still 
got burnt after just 20 minutes. I got to put SPF 100 on when I go to the beach, y'all. Like, when I got saved, I still had blue eyes. There was only a change that happened on the inside, not on the outside. And you see, when we are really changed by God, people may see us on the outside the same, but on the inside, everything is different. I think about it like this, like I have my watch on this morning and uh, you see the face of the watch, but the contents inside of this that makes this watch tick, it's an Apple watch, there's a battery inside, there's a a chip inside, other kind of nerdy stuff, you know, that are making this thing on and it's a computer basically, right? And if I don't recharge this watch every single night, what happens, the contents are the same on the inside, but the Outside of it will turn off. Listen, if you don't recharge your battery every night or every day by getting with the Lord and spending time with him during your personal encounter with God, the world won't know about what is happening on the inside of you. We say as Christians oftentimes that, hey, a smile will change things. I agree, but man, sharing the gospel is really what will lead people to repentance. Sharing the gospel is what really is going to lead people to know about the one that you love. It's not enough just to smile at them. You see, the world needs Jesus, and we are the people who God has entrusted us with to take the gospel to the world and to share about the one that we love. The contents on the inside are Jesus, and we must be filled up with him. And what I, what I believe and what I know is that in this place, that many of you, you've experienced this new passion, this new fire that God has placed on the inside of you. And we've kind of said this, in, in Proverbs it says, uh, that you have to put wood on the fire. There's a fire that's been placed, and the wood that you need to keep on placing on the fire is the wood of, of the Lord, of just being with Jesus. You can't let the fire burn out. Don't let the passion, don't you dare, let the passion that God has put inside of you ever burn out. It can't just be emotional. It can't just be some type of experience. It has to be this discipline with getting with the Lord. Use this God encounter that you've had. And what? May it lead to this personal encounter with the Lord. And that personal encounter with the Lord should lead you to share about the one that you love. Because, you know, we do look different. The Christian walk does look different than the world. We are set apart. You know, Moses in Exodus 33, when, when, when God tells him, hey, because of you worshiping the golden calf, I'm going to leave you from this point. Because if not, I'm going to destroy you. I'm frustrated with you. And Moses' response was, God, don't leave us. Don't leave us. Like we have to, he says, what will separate us other than just you being with us? You see, he knew that he had to have the presence of God. He would rather stay in the desert with God than go to the promised land without him. I don't know about you, but my one desire and my one thing that I'm after is just to walk and step with the Lord. Do I do it perfectly every single day? Absolutely not. I'm far from perfect, but man, I know the one who is. I know the one who we can get before and we can, we can know and have this personal relationship. My challenge you to, you to this is you must look different. The only way you're going to look different is through spending time with him. Here's the beautiful thing about Christ too. He's a God who can supply every single need that you have in your life. Every need that you have, he can supply. Think about this wedding. It's a small town, Cain of Galilee. The first miracle that Jesus does is for a young couple. The first miracle is not in a palace in front of kings. It's not in front of religious elite, it's for this young couple who if the wine would have ran out, it would have been this stigma around their marriage and some would have believed that it would have been cursed. But Jesus came in just for this young couple to provide a miracle. But it didn't happen because he wasn't invited. Jesus wasn't a wedding crasher. <laughs> Jesus was not a wedding crasher. He was invited to the wedding. He was invited to the wedding and in his invitation through obedience, through doing something ridiculous, through the servants doing something ridiculous, he provided a miracle for this young couple. 
What areas of your life have you not invited Jesus fully into? You may be saying, God, I really need you to move right now. I need a miracle right now. But he's saying, hey, I've asked you to do something. And you know what it is he's asked you to do. But until you move, until you do that thing that doesn't make sense to you, you won't see the miracle. Maybe God is asking you to do something. Whatever your life, have you not really fully submitted and surrendered to Jesus? Whatever your life, have you not invited him into? We all have areas of our life that we kind of held on to, right? I have areas of my life that I struggle with giving fully over to God. If we're really honest with ourselves, we're really there. But what area is God really saying, hey, I need this area right now? Because it's a, it's a process. Following the Lord's a process. What area do you need to surrender to the Lord this morning? And some of you in this room, you never invited Jesus into your life at all. So I want to give you this invitation today. Maybe today you need to give your life to Jesus. Would you do me a favor this morning? Would you rise with me? What area of your life do you need to invite Jesus into? What area has the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now? And he's saying, hey, give this area to me. Give this area to me. And obey. I just want to meditate on this question this morning. What area do you need to invite Jesus into? What area do you need to obey and to do it over the top, just as the servants filled it to the brim, for you give God everything? What area is it? Would you just shout your eyes right now, right where you're at? We just ask the Lord to show you what area you need to give the Lord.